Well, thank you all for being here to um, discuss this with us. We definitely want to open it up to questions uh, because we do realize that whether you're in newsrooms or sitting at the Shorenstein Center, we're sort of on the front line of the research that is happening and we're happy to share as much of it as we can today. Um, in fact, I might start, Cameron, asking you that is inside the Shorenstein Information Disorder Project, there are about a dozen people um, dedicated to this project from now up until the 2020 election. Um, what is your approach to monitoring? Maybe you could share with people how we're approaching this and what we're trying to do to get our hands around this information disorder. Sure. Um, so we are uh, approaching monitoring from two different perspectives. One, uh, between now and the end of this year, so the window covering the midterms, uh, we've identified uh, a number of topics that we want to monitor. So things around which we've, we've recognized that there is uh, frequently mis- or disinformation. Uh, those, there are nine topics. One of them is the, the key midterm races. One of them is conspiracy broadly. And then three are around different um, race-related issues. So one about Latinx and immigration, one about um, African-American and uh, you know, police brutality and that's, that set of issues, uh, and one about Islamophobia. Um, then we've also got one about voter integrity, um, e economy and trade, um, and now I'm forgetting what the other two are, but um, platform accountability, so the way that the uh, uh, platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter uh, impact their users and the public at large. And, um, and, and, and uh, the last one that we, everyone is, thinks is very sexy in the news media, which is foreign interference uh, in our democracy. Um, so we were, we've got a really sort of detailed methodology for how we monitor across all of social media to identify mis- or disinformation that falls into one of those topics. Um, in addition to that approach to monitoring, we also have an approach that we call source monitoring. So identifying suspect sources because there's a, a high likelihood that anything that they share might be mis- or disinformation. So we've identified sources and those can be specific channels of information such as uh, 4chan, which is an awful place I hope none of you ever go, but uh, 4chan and specifically the Paul or politically incorrect board on 4chan where a lot of some of the most vile memes and uh, coordinated disinformation campaigns get hatched. There are other closed network platforms such as uh, Discord, WhatsApp, Telegram. Um, and then there are uh, our mainstream channels like Twitter, YouTube, uh, and Facebook where we've identified specific sources on those platforms that, that are known purveyors of mis- and disinformation that we monitor on a daily basis. We filter it by how popular they are, whether or not they contain any of the keywords or terms from our topic monitoring approach. And we sort of funnel all of that uh, content in, into a uh, database in which we are then identifying things that we think are particularly concerning that we need to analyze further. And uh, you, with our whole team, we work together to uh, code and categorize that content and then um, score it so that we can decide what's the most critical um, to identify long-term trends about or to um, alert newsrooms of the public about. Um, so that's sort of the, the overall strategy, but it's got these, these two pillars, looking at specific topics, um, that are relevant to the midterms and looking at specific sources that we uh, don't trust. Um, I think following the midterms, we're, we're reevaluating what exactly our next focus will be. I know that one, a lot of the political content will remain. Um, I think that science and health is another big uh, area which we want to understand better because we've been so focused on politics, we've sort of left it to the side. Um, and another one which is a big issue that's going to be coming up broadly is the census. So the, the 2020 census will be the first digital census, the first online census, and the risks that that poses are incredibly significant and we've only just begun to brainstorm what that might be. So one of the things the Information Disorder Lab does is produce this research um, so that whether it's um, platforms, Congress, and newsrooms um, want this information, we'll, we have these briefings and white papers that will be coming out. And so Peter, I look to you as someone who's had a lot of time in those newsrooms and, uh, and abroad as well. Uh, where do you think that you could use the most support right now for newsrooms on understanding this moment? Um, where do you feel like you know, you're sort of uh, drowning in it and you need um, research and support? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that using uh, operations like the Shorenstein Center as sources who can identify the sources of some of these stories and also just as a major part of our political coverage, you know, what is being, uh, 
talked about on social media at any given moment and where it comes from and how it has a political effect and providing some corrective to that uh, I think is very, very important. But you know, you'd be surprised how difficult it is to find credible in the moment kinds of sources uh, for this, this type of story. We've done at Politico a fair number of those stories. I think only a fraction of the number that we probably should be doing. Uh, but they're also hugely popular with readers. So I would say it's almost like a, a genre of journalism of plumbing the web uh, that, that needs to be cultivated and needs to be developed. And so all the work that you guys are doing uh, is really crucial to that mission. And when you put out news um, and you're saying, you know, you get to, to uh, your story and the narrative's already been set by social media, how are you in the newsroom dealing with that? And how, walk us through editorially how you guys are looking at that. Because well, it's a, if it's there were a, an outbreak in a pandemic or a, you know, a flu virus, how, how do you deal with that sort of thing? To re, do you give to, how do you get to the context, which journalism well, does? Well, first of all, I think, I think in the disease context and things like that, at, at a place like Politico, we do have a very large health staff. We have a, a, a healthcare product, Politico Pro uh, Healthcare, which is actually our largest and most successful. Uh, uh, subscription product. It, it's really terrific. And so we have about 15 journalists who are healthcare specialists. So I would reassure you that in a, in a healthcare context, there would be a certain amount of expertise that would be brought to bear, independent expertise on top of what was being said um, uh, on, so, on social media. So, so I think that we would be, you know, proportionally more sort of cautious, substantive, uh, uh, you know, cognizant of our role in terms of setting the uh, the agenda in in healthcare than we might be in politics just because politics is such a free for all right. the challenge that you face on the political side is simply the one that I that I illustrated if you if your compact with your readers at a place like politico is we are going to tell you what's going on now in politics you know you guys want to know you don't want to know what should be going on you don't want to know what might be going on a week from now you want to know what is going on right now what's going on with kavanaugh what's going on in washington about kavanaugh well if social media is largely uh purveying some uh conspiracy theory that the woman who came forward was working for gloria aldred or something like that do we say that's a fake story we're not going to cover it at all we're just not going to give it the dignity of any attention. You're not going to see it on Politico. We're exercising our, our right as independent journalists not to cover this because it's a bogus story. Or do you say this actually is having tremendous political impact and could move uh, Republican senators to support Kavanaugh? Uh, we have to cover it. Uh, I say, of course, we do have to cover it. And we have to cover it as something that is, is moving the chains politically. But we also, in real time, have to have the ability to provide a fact check, context, you know, uh, truth or falsehood uh, check. And, uh, uh, you know, finding sources who can provide that information reliably and credibly in the very, very short time frame that we have to prepare those stories would be a huge help. It takes time. Ashka, one of the things you and I talked about from your study um, yesterday when we were preparing for this was we, we know this because we talk about it all the time, but and maybe you don't know this, so maybe just talk about how the amplification drives the, the profit in media and how um, that then translates into the imagery. You, you nodded to it a bit in, the, um, in your intro, but just maybe lay out that framework for us if you could. How does it work today in social media and why are we seeing this sort of amplification everywhere? Sure, um, I can talk you guys through a part of this process. Imagine for a minute that you're just scrolling through a news feed. It can be on Instagram, it can be on Facebook, it can be on Twitter and you see something that sort of catches your attention as you're scrolling, and you're probably scrolling very quickly because most people scroll kind of quickly. And in order for it to catch your attention, it has to spark some sort of impulse in you. The headline has to be catchy. The um, text at the bottom of the link is probably going to be something that makes you think, oh, let me see a bit more of that. But in some way, there has to be a hook to that piece of content to get you to click. That hook is then going to take you from the Facebook page or the Twitter page or whatever to the organization's website. And then once you're on the website, you're going to see the content that you were looking for. There's probably going to be a big image at the top. Again, that image or that headline is going to be the thing that sort of motivates you to keep reading and to keep scrolling. From the perspective of a news organization, this is also a really good opportunity to put some ads on the side so that they can get some revenue in the process. And of course, news organizations need to make money. That's fair. But when they're measuring in such a way that the click-through rate is so important, that rate being 
being the rate at which people click from a social media platform over to a website, or when they're measuring in such a way that you're looking for engagement around a specific post, when you're measuring quality or success by the idea that a post is getting so many likes or so many comments or so many shares rather than the substance of the post itself, on a day-to-day -day basis, that can be completely fine, but then when there's a situation of extreme risk or something that's very serious or something that needs to be communicated, that process can be problematic. If you're going to, if I'm someone who's just trying to find out information about the flu vaccine, right, and I see a post that talks about the flu, I'm like, oh, that picture's cool, let me click it. If I have to go from step to step in this sort of funnel process to get to the information I need, that's a lot of time in which I can get distracted, in which I can lose interest in going through this process of clicking and scrolling. And if all of that information is surfaced to me immediately on the social media platform, then that could be more helpful, especially when I just need that information now. Of course, at the end of the day, that doesn't really help the revenue consideration of the news organization, but it does make a difference in terms of, am I the audience person who now has a lot more information? So we always say in media, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. And now in this moment of time, I, I ask all of you, um, how do we deal with that in a crisis moment, whether it's a climate crisis or a health crisis or even a political crisis? Um, news media has always put, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and now when you know, everything's at such a point of hysteria, um, how do we deal with that as uh, journalists in newsrooms? <laughs> I, um, I mean, I think that for those of us in the mainstream media, we are in the midst of a process of trying to rebuild, regain, and bolster trust across the board. For the mainstream media to be successful in the long run, people have to see the flaws that Ashka was just describing and that sort of grazing for news and finding the most sensational headline and believing what it is your confirmation bias leads you to believe. They have to feel like they're being misserved by that process, that there's just so much junk out there and so much that's wrong. You have to rebuild trust by being quick and being accurate and having people just come to you automatically for that kind of news. So if there were a pandemic, if there were a health thing, you know, being authoritative, being quick, taking, you know, if we at Politico took advantage of those 15 health reporters that we had to try to really highlight what is true, what's not true, and give people a sort of one-stop shopping for what's out there and, and the information that they need, we'd be making a step, probably a small step, towards uh, uh, a better, you know, promoting a better flow of information uh, in the country. So for newsrooms and for other things, you know, you do have to be quick, but we also have to understand that our mission is based on accuracy, trust, context, balance, and, and those sort of traditional verities. And, uh, you know, within newsrooms, there is a, a there are certainly voices that think that we should be more sensational, more like the web, you know, adapt ourselves much, much more to, to people grazing. And um, I think thankfully in recent years, those voices have been a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You're going for a long-term play. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so I, I, I want to suggest something, and I'm speaking as myself, not for the Shorenstein Center now, but what, one, of the things that, uh, one of the things that we noticed in uh, evaluating these different platforms and the, the publishers on them. That, that graph of all those red bars that I showed you before where these, all these junk news sites have millions and millions of subscribers. It's important to ask the question, how did they get all of those subscribers, right? Are, are the fans of those publications that much greater? I mean, there are a bunch yes. of publications yes. you've, never, you've never heard of. And in, in our reporting um, that I did for the PBS NewsHour on the subject, what we found is, by and large, those fans were bought. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're fake fans, right? It's not some click farm or some bots. But what, what they've done is they've come up with a way to employ the advertising systems used on primarily Facebook in that example, but the same is true on YouTube or uh, Twitter or Instagram or wherever. You design ads that are really engaging, just like we're talking about how you design uh, posts that are really engaging. And the more engaging your post is, the cheaper it is to run it, because the more likely each of these ad auction systems are to put it in front of someone. And what that means is, every time you run an ad, and I'll give you a, a kind of a literal example, many of those conservative sites ran ads that said, if you think Donald Trump is the greatest president ever, click like to agree. And, and, and the exact opposite was true. If you think Donald Trump should be impeached, click like to agree. And millions and millions of dollars were spent by domestic publishers using ads like these to build audiences. And people like my grandmother or your cousin 
saw those things appearing in their Facebook feed and they appealed to them because of the uh, way in which they were emotionally charged and they clicked like. And what they didn't recognize was that they became unwitting fans of these platforms. And I think that this is one of the signature ways. We, we talked a little bit about how you know the Russian uh, Internet Research Agency spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on such ads, right? That's a drop in the bucket of what all these domestic publishers have spent. And the, they have now acquired this audience, right? And so now every new thing that they publish will appear to some, to greater or lesser degree, in the feeds of all those people. So if you, if someone, I frequently use my grandmother as the example. My grandmother likes the PBS NewsHour, and she likes ProPublica, and she write, likes the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Politico. That's five things, and then she's liked 50 other things that are these junk sources. Then she's going to see 10x more of that content in her feed than any of the more legitimate content, right? And it all starts with those ads. And so here's my, this is my personal advice. We need to be more realistic about how we reach the audience with our critical information and think about how we employ those same ad targeting tools, what, what Ashka started to talk about, um, to actually directly reach those people by spending money to reach them. Because that's how all of the, our adversaries are accomplishing this goal, and they're beating us right now. I think, I think given all that, though, there's, there's one other huge hurdle to overcome, and that is the social aspect of social media. You know, it's, it's only partly media, it's, it's largely social. If, if two friends are sharing political views, if, if let's say you believe that, you know, pro-choice is under siege or whatever, and somebody said some fake news thing about how Kavanaugh once said, you know, his goal in life is to overturn Roe v. Wade and passes it on to you. It's, it's not just that people are sort of seeking information in that context, it's like they're seeking friendship, they're seeking validation, it becomes a, a bond, a, a, you know, a, a, an expression of trust and friendship. And, and it's very, very hard to penetrate that. And the ideological outlets and some of the manipulators have really succeeded in creating these like-minded communities that are perpetuating their values. And I don't, I don't think it's a good idea for the mainstream media to try to create our own sort of social networks. And when you see it happening somewhat around the New York Times, you know, the, the NPR, the tote Clubs bags and, and things, it, it's, it's, it's troubling uh, and threatening, but it's also kind of understandable and it's just something we have to wrestle with a little bit. We're, we're almost out of time. Can we have five extra minutes to go to questions? Is that okay? Okay, so questions. Come on up. <laughs> Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, you talked, Peter, about uh, 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 reliable sources, but what if those reliable sources are unreliable? Take the opioid epidemic. The FDA completely dropped the ball on that. Uh, the American, uh, the uh, various professional associations completely dropped the ball on it, and it became, yes, Purdue Pharma was egregious in what they did, but it was also complicit from those uh, organizations that should have protected us, but didn't. Um, that's one question. So how do you deal with uh, reliable sources that become unreliable? Mm -hmm. The second question I have for the panel is, how much use do we make of the information that we get from sources outside of the United States? I travel a lot. And sometimes it's amazing to me the differences between the way people approach subjects who are outside the United States and within the United States. We just have to go back quite a long time ago to the Iraq war and everybody was saying there are no weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq. It's total nonsense. And I came back to the United States from being overseas and came into a firestorm where everybody, including the New York Times, believed all that crap. So how much do we do we uh, uh, pay attention to what people outside of our country are saying? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick answer to both of those. One is, um, when we talk about trusted sources, that, doesn't, that isn't always the official source. I, I, I am glad that the FDA and CDC are broadly trusted as a citizen. I'm glad they're trusted. But I don't think as a journalist you take what they say as uh, you know, the gospel truth and end the inquiry there. You know, 80 years ago, the scientific consensus, even the most important scientists in the country, the scientific consensus, think of what it was on germs, think of what it was on smoking, think of what it was on blood pressure rates. I mean, 
all of it has been changed. So there has to be an element of skepticism. You cannot ignore minority viewpoints. Uh, you have to use, the reporter has to use the totality of their knowledge and experience to try to produce what they feel is the most broadly accurate report. And the, the inquiry does not end when you talk to the, to the official sources and the possibility that official sources are being influenced by uh, political concerns or caution or you know, over deference to certain aspects of the community. Uh, that, that definitely has to be uh, considered. As far as the overseas sources go, personally, I think the Iraq reporting was a major uh, uh, problem for the mainstream media and that, that it hasn't gotten enough uh, attention even now. Uh, you know, the media is very, very good at uh, hounding out the person who fabricates something, but they're not very good at looking how their own procedures may include some flaws and the uh, discrediting of some of the UN information by the Bush administration and sort of taking that at face value was, I think, a terrible mistake. Uh, that doesn't mean that every overseas source that people aren't familiar with and don't know it is, is something that, that should be taken into consideration, but, uh, but looking more broadly for sources, especially on some of these national security issues, is a good idea. I'll just add to that, in full disclosure, I consulted with them, but there's an outfit here at a Boston called dailychatter.com started by Phil Balboni, who had started NECN. And Phil has, uh, is very passionate about the loss of um, international bureaus, um, which you're familiar with that business. And I see Jim Smith is here, who is our uh, director at the Information Historical Lab in the back. And Jim spent time abroad as a reporter as well. And with the loss of foreign bureaus, um, Phil is very concerned about that. So you can sign up for dailychatter.com. And every morning, he does uh, an analysis of a number of the English-speaking papers around the globe and gives you that perspective outside of the US. But it's a problem. <laughs> uh, thank you. My question is sort of about how people get information in natural disasters. I mean, fortunately, large uh, outbreaks that threaten a substantial number of people are, are rare events. But uh, in kind of a similar vein, we, we have natural disasters all the time. And people have to uh, look for uh, sort of practical information about are public officials telling them to evacuate, and do they agree that they should evacuate, and, and other kinds of preparedness messaging. So do people who have liked, perhaps without even realizing it, a lot of these junk news type sources, do they turn to those sources for this kind of information? Uh, do they uh, look at other sources for it? I mean, because it, it seems like that while not a perfect analog to what happens or might happen in an outbreak, is maybe a better analog than how do people get their political news? We, we actually look at natural disasters a lot because frequently misinformation follows them. The uh, po most popular joke in our office is whenever there's a hurricane coming, we gotta be on the lookout for the first appearance of that shark on the highway because every single <laughs> hurricane, that same fake picture of a shark swimming down the highway always appears. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, it's challenging to uh, try and, it's challenging to expect that people should get all of their information from social media. We would hope that uh, official sources have different and more um, effective and legitimate channels, right? But that isn't the case. People do immerse themselves in social media, right? The amount of time that if you get on the T or you are, you know, even scarily enough driving in your car or wherever, the amount of time people are staring at their phones and the thing that they're looking at is social media or in my favorite case, my grandmother, the amount of hours a day that she spends consuming content from there means that that is the main place where that content is coming, where, where they're getting that information, right? I think one of the problems that social media has created is that, that it has flattened the, our understanding of what the content is, right? So uh, an example we used to talk about when we were reporting on this was that you knew where the junk news was 20 years ago. It was stuffed right next to the checkout lane in the uh, grocery store, right? That was where the news of the world and the whatever all of those other, you know, phony tabloids were, right? And, and, the, and the way that the newsstand was structured, it was much clearer how, where you got your international news, your mainstream uh, newspapers. And we don't have that distinction and that clear frame anymore. 
everything on Facebook essentially looks the same, right? It's that same box with that same picture, with that same headline, and maybe a teeny tiny little circle that shows you the logo of whatever that brand is. And plenty of people are co-opting those brands, usually with an American flag, so you can't tell what the difference is. And I think that we should expect from these platforms to do a better job of helping us distinguish between these kinds of sources, right? And Because they're not doing it today, and they attempt to do it behind the scenes, algorithmically, right? They, Facebook has implemented an approach where they ask users what are sources that you trust, and then without explaining what those scores are, have dialed up the likelihood that Politico or the New York Times appears higher in your feed and dialed down American Patriot Daily and how frequently that appears in your feed. But we don't have a lot of transparency on that in terms of what they're doing, and the frames have remained the same. And so I think that if we accept the problem that, that social media is where we get that information. We need to do a better job of understanding how we frame things differently so that trusted sources are easier to recognize. I would also point out that different demographics get their news differently. I use social media very, very differently than my parents do. My parents still get their primary news from watching the TV. Meanwhile, at my apartment, I have Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, but I'm not gonna turn on a television to watch the news in the same way that someone else might. So when we're thinking about getting public warnings out about natural disasters or any other health situation, those warnings and those pieces of advice need to be tailored to specific demographics and go to the places where we know they are. Because even if everything looks the same, different people are looking at social media, the same platform, in very different ways. So the context that um, we started with, with with Mike's introduction, and I think we'll get to more after this and tomorrow in vaccines, is basically in infectious disease, misinformation is deadly, and deadly on a large scale. So the question of vaccine literacy came up, and I think what, in a way what, 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 what we've been hearing in this session is a lot about what you might call media illiteracy among the general public, which yeah. is, is, we know, deadly. So the, uh, um, Cameron's presentation on junk news and, and how, do I identify, how do you identify it raises the question, is media literacy a teachable skill? And is it a skill that we ought to be teaching beginning early in school at the time when people are getting on social media, getting their, their phones and all, and when they aren't sort of totally full of, of habits, ideas, and everything else, as one piece of a multi-part media literacy effort. Uh, that's the question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, what, 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 one thing I'll say is, you know, we're all looking at it at the Shorenstein Center and in newsrooms differently. How do we have a multi-pronged approach to this? So yes, news literacy, how do we get that into schools is a key one. There's some people looking at trying to get that funded. Everything's about getting it funded. So, you know, I'm personally a big local news believer. So Jerry Lenfest in Philadelphia just left $20 million and put Philly Inquirer, Philly.com, and the Daily News, which were the three entities he owned, he put them all in a nonprofit. I'm up from the private side, so I'm not sure nonprofit's the way for journalism forever. But maybe while we get through this hump, we need a bunch of $20 million local newspaper saves. And then people can at least go to their local newspaper online, because Ashka's age group is not going to read the paper. They're online. So we need to have those sources. We need to bolster those local news sources. Um, and we need to bolster some nationals like Politico, where you just know that you can trust that Politico has gone through rigorous research, you know, has called five sources. We have to feed that, and there's no revenue model for journalism right now because Facebook and Google have taken 90, and Twitter have taken 90% of the profit. So uh, we do need to bolster local news, and we do need to have education, and it's going to take money. So call some of your biopharma companies and tell them to put some money into the local journalism. Well, the issue of teaching uh, media literacy at a young age is something that the mainstream media organizations would all benefit from. And also there's tremendous, uh, as you were saying, Heidi, tremendous nonprofit interest and interest in academics. And we should get together. I mean, this, these are not institutions that are uh, comfortable working with each other, especially the media organizations. Uh, but we need to do that, do that more now and understand the benefits. And it's far better to have uh, it done through the private sector than to have it done through the government, I, I think, yeah. much better. Cameron, you uh, I was, too, was going to mention uh, me media liter literacy. 
Um, so, but as a follow-on, taking it from the macro and the $20 million level, what am I to do when I see the shark going through um, the streets of pick a city that's flooded? Because I have a call to the truth and I'm repeatedly saying that that's just not true and linking to Snopes, but that is, I feel as though it's even less than a teaspoon in the ocean. Um, so I, I, that's my immediate, while I'm on Facebook, what, what can I do? But also, how are we to encourage social media platforms to um, desist from the junk? Um, so I think on, on the, the, the first question, what, what do we do? There's a couple of ways to answer that. One could be a, a plug for the New York Times, which just launched, uh, you know, submit your tip here so the New York Times can report on them. They want to, you know, all, the public to submit, and, and many organizations ha have similar ways to try and get reporting on that content. Um, at our uh, organization, we think a lot about more responsible reporting broadly, and that's generally advice we give to newsrooms, but I think it's also useful for regular users on social media, and, and a big component of that is when you identify something that's not true, um, repeating the claim is really dangerous, right? So some fact checkers, I won't name names, uh, when they post their fact checks, they put in big letters exactly what the claim is, and then underneath it it says, determination, false. Right? And there's a little red box. You know, sometimes it's got Pinocchios or sometimes it's got some other metaphor for it. But they post that claim in really big letters without debunking it in the claim. So instead of uh, posting, you know, uh, that isn't, um, like putting the, the main piece of the claim, you know, shark found on highway in this flood, it's about maybe making a, point, a broader point. Sharks can't swim on highways, right? This is a, a concept that we can push out instead of in any way being guilty of reiterating whatever the claim is. And that's probably not the best examples. There's a lot more that we see in politics where you really want to push what the truth is instead of reiterating or nitpicking what the falsehood is. And so I think that, also, that applies in particular to newsrooms where we say, all right, a bunch of different people have reported about this piece of false information on social media. Do we then report on the fact that everyone's talking about it on social media? Well, probably not. Like some cases, it's unavoidable. But hopefully, what you can do instead is look at ways to say, here's the things that we actually know. Here's what's true and why it's important to your understanding, um, both with respect to media liter literacy, but also respect to civics more broadly. Like this is the way that the world actually works, and here are the facts. And so I think that's the way that I like to look at framing everything that you experience online. Well, and part of media literacy should be distrusting what your, you know, goofball friend sends you on, on Facebook, you know? It's like, that's, that's what it has to be, you know? It, and it has to be looking to trusted outlets. You know? We're all gonna hang around so you can ask us more questions. Um, thank you so much for your time. I do wanna make one last plug for journalistresource.org. It's a Shorenstein um, news site. It is, I think a lot of you will like it. It's academic research from universities across the U.S. Um, or I think Chloe's here. Chloe, is it just the U.S. or is it international? The this, this studies. Do you take them from U.S. colleges, right? Everywhere. From everywhere. So they'll take a study and reduce it to 750 words of fact, unbiased, straight fact. Um, it's your vegetables. It's called journalsresource.org, um, and um, that's a place you can definitely get some basic facts on some large studies. Thank Great. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And a uh, big round of applause for the panel. So this was, I mean, this discussion, I think, is like fundamental not just to outbreaks, public health, but really to the health of our democracy. And so I wish we had like another hour to go through this. I had a bunch of questions and I had to shut myself off and not ask.